Hello my friends, welcome to my corner. Here I am to share with you some ideas about The Wasteland, a poem that, as you may know, has the reputation of being a difficult poem by a difficult poet. I think that when it comes to reading, when it comes to literature, sometimes things are as complicated as we make them. When I read a text, of course, I do not ask myself what did the author mean to say with this text, or even what does this text mean? My only question is, what does it mean to me? You know, so that is the approach that I encourage you to take when it comes to the wasteland. I encourage you to experience this poem as purely as you can, if I can use that word. Uh, this is a poem that you want to make your own, that you want to appropriate. And I know that these days the word appropriation has negative connotations for sure. But we are going to see that appropriation is actually one of the central themes or the, the central issues of the poem. So that is definitely something that we can do when it comes to the wasteland. We can definitely appropriate this poem that works by appropriation. A little bit about the publication history. The Wasteland was first published in October of 1922 in the UK in the journal The Criterion, which was founded by T.S. Eliot. So you could say that The Wasteland is actually an example of self-publishing. It was published one month later in November of 1922 in the American journal The Dial. And it was in December of 1922 that it was first published in book form. As you know by now, I love books, so that is what I am celebrating here with this video. The centennial of the publication of The Wasteland in book form. Let me tell you a little bit about the approach that I am going to follow here. I want to explore this poem in detail, okay? I think this is one poem, there are many of them, right? But this is one poem that really uh, calls for, uh, or allows us, you know, or justifies uh, a very detailed approach. So what we are going to do is we are going to look really closely at the text, at the sections into which the poem is divided, the stanzas, the lines, and sometimes even the words, okay? So uh, I'm also going to point out the poem's most important themes. My hope is that the analysis that I am providing is neither too broad nor too detailed. So some preliminaries, okay, before we actually look at the poem in detail. Some people have called The Wasteland a modernist epic, a fragmented epic, even. If we are talking about epic, that sort of suggests or includes, you know, it comes with the territory that there should be a hero, or since we're in the realm of modernism, at least an anti-hero. So I believe that there is a hero. I believe that there is a protagonist. There is a central figure in the wasteland, okay? This may seem obvious to some readers, depending on the approach that you have, but believe it or not, this is actually a point that causes division among readers of the wasteland. There are some readers who believe that there is not a single protagonist, but that is the approach that I favor. I believe that there is one anti-hero, not a hero, but an anti-hero, and that that is the protagonist of the poem, but more to come about that in a few minutes. As I was saying, you know, uh, there is a central figure, and in some ways, that central figure is Eliot himself. Now, in his notes to the poem, which were not part of the first edition, as you may know, Eliot said that uh, that central figure was Tiresias. Okay, Tiresias, who, as you may know, was both man and woman. Okay, so he is a figure that transcends, encompasses, you know, both genders or both sexes, and transcends them also. Another important figure to the poem is that of the Fisher King, who may be the same person, quote-unquote, as Tiresias, the, the same person as Eliot. Okay, these are figures that do not really exclude each other, but they are all, you know, a, a bit of a composite uh, here in the, in the poem. Eliot said that the main idea for the poem had come from Jesse Weston's book, From Ritual to Romance. Okay, this is the book that suggested, he said, the entire idea of the wasteland. So Eliot gave credit to uh, Weston for uh, this book, but we have to remember here when it comes to approaching the wasteland a very important remark that Eliot himself makes in one of his essays. Okay, and uh, I'm going to read you this. It's from uh, The Sacred Wood, his essay on Philip Massinger. Okay, immature poets imitate mature poets steal. Bad poets deface what they take, and good poets make it into something better, or at least something different. 
the good poet welds his theft into a whole of feeling which is unique, utterly different from that which, from which it was torn. The bad poet throws it into something which has no cohesion. So very important remarks here that we should keep in mind, because once again we are talking about appropriation, even though Eliot of course gave credit to Jessie Weston and her book From Ritual to Romance. Let me share some ideas with you about the editions now. So the first time that I encountered The Wasteland, it was in a Norton anthology of British literature. It was during a college course. I was taking a course on, uh, it was a survey of British literature, and the professor did something that I thought was really, really interesting. During the semester, we looked um, at poems by different authors. We would look at a given poem, you know, for example, in the case of Eliot, it was The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. But then for the final exam, the final exam would be, for instance, on The Wasteland which I think is wonderful. Right? I mean, at the moment I thought it was terrible and I hated it, but now I realize, you know, in retrospect, that is a fantastic uh, approach because what the professor was saying was, I do not want you to regurgitate all that we said in class about the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, but rather to take that approach, to do what we did with that poem and apply that to the wasteland, you know, something that we have not experienced together. So I thought that was great. But uh, when it came to, you know, getting my own version, of the poem, what I got was this, the complete plays and poems, actually the complete poems and plays, as you know I am famous for messing up the titles of books of T.S. Eliot from 1909 to 1950. So 1909 to 1950, that means that you are missing a couple of plays, if you get this one. You would be missing uh, The Confidential Clark and also The Elderly Statesman, but I believe the poems are complete and I, I think that these days you can buy an edition that has all of the poems and all of the plays. I am also a big fan of the modern library, so I just had to get this uh, volume with, you know, some poems, uh, and also, you know, it's titled The Wasteland and Other Writings. So you get the early poems, the four quartets are not included here, and also The Sacred Wood. So you get a lot of essays by Eliot, so that you can also see what he was like as a critic. And it also includes a really good, really good introduction by Mary Carr, author of The Liar's Club, right? Titled, How to Read the Wasteland So It Alters Your Soul Rather Than Just Addling Your Head. It's a great introduction, okay? It's just wonderful. It really does the trick, you know? It really helps you to come to the wasteland for the first time, and I, I really appreciated that. But if you want to get the definitive edition of the poem with criticism and all that, this is the one that I recommend, okay? The Norton Critical Edition. This has, uh, of course, the poem, Eliot's notes. Also, one thing that I thought was really cool was that it includes excerpts from all of those works that Eliot references. Okay, so you have stuff from Aldous Huxley, from James Fraser, from Jesse Weston, right? The tarot, pack of cards, and all that. Uh, there's even uh, the lyrics, you know, you even have the lyrics and the music to the Shakespearean rag. So, I mean, this is really complete. And then, of course, it has a lot of essays, critical essays and analyses of the poem, including my favorite one. I think this is the essay that you want to read if you want to, you know, explore the wasteland in detail, which is the one by Clenth Brooks Jr., The Wasteland and Analysis. Okay, this is, I believe, it says here from 19... 37. So, uh, you know, th that is the uh, critical text to experience on the wasteland. And there's one more thing that I want to share with you before we begin, and you may be wondering, you may be even expecting it, okay? There is a certain author that I have not mentioned yet in this video. Of course, the Borges connection. Okay, so let me share a little bit with you about that. Where's my Borges? Here it is. Uh, Borges mentioned uh, Eliot, of course, and the wasteland in a couple of occasions. This first part, uh, first little excerpt that I wanted to share with you is from Textos Cautivos. So we're talking about those texts that he published in the El Hogar magazine. And he says about the wasteland, right? He has a little, little biography, little biographical piece on Eliot. And he says about the wasteland, its wise obscurity disconcerted and continues to disconcert the critics, but it is less important than its beauty beauty, I think, is a very interesting term to employ when talking about the wasteland, right? The perception of that beauty, moreover, precedes any interpretation and does not depend on it. And he goes on to recommend F. O. Matheson's analysis of the poem, which is included in The Achievement of T. S. Eliot. 
this this book by Matheson. So that's the one that he recommends. And he also shares a little bit of um, an excerpt, you know, from um, Eliot's first chorus from the rock in uh, translation to Spanish, which, you know, we may presume that Eliot, um, I mean Borges, translated himself. So uh, that's an interesting uh, little addition there. He also mentions Eliot in his introduction to British literature. He also mentions him in his introduction to American literature. So uh, is Eliot a British or an American poet? That, that's another story. You know, uh, this video is long enough as it is. In his introduction to uh, British literature, this is what Borges says about Eliot that I thought was interesting. His lines do not allow us to forget the laborious rough drafts that preceded them, but they are sometimes splendid and they are charged with nostalgia and solitude. So that is a little bit of Borges' assessment of T.S. Eliot and specifically of the wasteland. I have spoken long enough and more than that, so let's just go into an analysis of the wasteland. I hope you enjoy it. So let's start at the beginning by looking at the title. Okay, to state what might seem to be obvious, I believe titles are important. And we have the title of The Wasteland, but this was not the original title of the poem. Actually, Eliot wanted to title the poem, He Do the Police in Different Voices. Let me repeat that. <laughs> he Do the Police in Different Voices. Okay, you might be thinking, what does that even mean, right? Um, one of the things that happened was that by choosing not to go with this title and choosing the wasteland, Eliot missed the great opportunity of being the author of the worst title in the history of literature. But this is a very appropriate title because it comes from Charles Dickens's novel, Our Mutual friend and they are they are talking about a character the character of sloppy who is quote unquote a beautiful reader of a newspaper because he do the police in different voices that is he changes his voice so as to suit the characters that he is impersonating or that he is quoting and this is one of the reasons why i believe that in the wasteland there are many voices but one speaker because this is a speaker who is you know, mimicking uh, the words of others. Uh, the wasteland is in many ways an act of ventriloquism, right? So uh, this title, the original title that Eliot had for the poem seems to support that. Now, I doubt, part of me at least, doubts that we would be speaking about the wasteland in the way that we are today if Eliot had gone with that original title. I think titles do have an effect, you know, on, on how we feel about a certain work and about the importance of that work. We have an epigraph from the Satyricon, the story of this Sibyl, right, who asked for immortality but forgot to ask for eternal youth. Uh, little detail right there. Something similar to what happened like um, to uh, Tythonus uh, from that poem by Tennyson. So we have a similar situation there. The poem is dedicated to Ezra Pound, who was, as you know, instrumental in giving it shape. Il miglior fabro, right? The better craftsman. And even the dedication here is, uh, in a sense, plagiarized, right? Because it's taken from Dante. So you can see that this is really a collection of voices from different texts and from different sources. The first part is titled The Burial of the Dead, an allusion to a part of the Book of Common Prayer. Um, and the first word, April, right? That makes me think of Chaucer, right? The, the Canterbury Tales is another poem that begins in April. And the verbs right here, some critics have seen in this breeding lilacs out of the dead land, mixing memory and desire, stirring. You have this mixing, this stirring, right? So some people have thought about the witches uh, in Macbeth, you know, stirring that cauldron. And of course we have the uh, allusion to the different seasons, spring, winter. Here we have summer also. So the seasons are an important uh, part of this poem. What you're seeing right here is the first stanza. At one point we get this uh, character who is speaking, right? When we were children, staying at the Archduke's My Cousins. So this is Marie, right? We have this character of Marie, who uh, the, the first character that is named or, or the first, first voice really, because this, remember, is one speaker who is impersonating all of these 
characters. It's one voice. This is based on the Countess uh, Marie Lariche, uh, who was of the Austrian nobility. It's based on uh, things, you know, elements from her memoirs, from her autobiography. So at first, that is what we get from this uh, speaker who is, you know, mouthing the, the words of, of these uh, different people, impersonating them and appropriating their experience. One line that I think is important here is this one, in the mountains, there you feel free. The mountain is also another symbol that is, uh, you know, recurring in the wasteland. Now, when we get to the second stanza, um, it is true that this speaker impersonates other characters, takes on their voice, but there are passages in the wasteland, I believe, where the speaker actually speaks with his or her, you know, own voice, right? And this is one of them. How can I tell, right? How do I tell that or how do I support that interpretation? Well, one of the reasons, uh, one of the ways in which I would support that is by the choice of words, by the tone, by the rhythm in which he speaks. But another uh, way, much easier to, to get to that conclusion is to listen to Eliot's own reading of his poem. You can probably find it online. I, I have a cassette version of it, believe it or not. Uh, and I listened to it many, many times. And there's a certain tone that he uh, uses in those passages that I would say are the voice of the speaker himself or herself. And there's a reason why I say himself or herself. It's complicated, but we will get to that in a second. So this passage right here, what are the roots that clutch? What branches grow out of this stony rubbish? I believe are spoken with the speaker's voice. So we have stony rubbish right here. The first uh, or one of the first images of this waste land, right? The, the stone and, and the rubbish, a heap of broken images. I think this part is, uh, has always stuck to me, you know, son of man, you cannot say or guess for, you know, only a heap of broken images. To me, this phrase describes the poem itself. What we have here is really a heap of broken images. And here you can take images as meaning icons, for instance, like religious icons, you know, we speak of images, but also just literally images like scenes, you know, it's not either or here. This is something that Eliot probably learned from Dante. It's not either or. You can use a word, you can use ambiguity to your, uh, you know, to, 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 to receive uh, basically a different meaning and also to suit your purposes. This is a characteristic of modernism, as you know, the ambiguity. We have other images like the dead tree right here, the dry stone, you know, and always this concept, no sound of water. There's always this, this longing for water, right? And we're going to see how that develops throughout the poem. A famous line right here is, I will show you fear and a handful of dust. We get some lines here from Wagner, right? From Tristan und Isolde, which is a very important source for the poem because the poem is tied to, as you know, Arthurian legend. So this is a recurring theme also. And in the last part of this stanza, we have the hyacinth episode, which you can see here. You gave me hyacinths first a year ago. They called me the hyacinth girl. A girl is speaking. And then we come back to the voice of the protagonist of the poem. He has an episode here. Something happens to him. And look at this. I could not speak and my eyes failed. I was neither living nor dead and I knew nothing looking into the heart of light, the silence. Now, I was neither living nor dead. Something that I keep thinking about when I read this poem is the concept of a living death, right? Many of the characters that we encounter in this poem are not living, but they are not dead either. It's almost like the characters in Dante's Inferno or Purgatorio, which are also great sources for this poem. And then looking into the heart of light, the silence. I believe we are meant to think of heart of darkness right there, right? So this is the opposite. Maybe the sun, right? You could think that maybe this character or this person fainted and he's looking straight at the sun when he opens his eyes. But it's also a reference to heart of darkness. And um, going back a little bit to the first page, the title page of the poem, Eliot had included a, uh, an epigraph from Heart of Darkness, one of the most famous lines 
from the novella. Yes, you have guessed it, the horror, the horror. Uh, Pound said something included, I have seen the, the facsimile of, um, you know, the wasteland. And there was a comment there by Pound. He did not say, take this out or anything like that, but he made a comment about Conrad and Elliot decided, he took maybe a, the hint and decided to get rid of that epigraph. So that's why we don't have it these days. Now, um, if you go to this stanza right here that begins Madame Sosostris, you can think of this as a story, right? So we have the voice of Marie, then uh, the voice of the protagonist himself. He remembers that episode. And now he could be just walking down the streets and he goes to this psychic. The name of Madame Sosostris, some people have pointed to a character named Madame Sesostris with an E where the first O is from Huxley's, Aldous Huxley's novel, Chrome Yellow. So maybe that would be the source for the name. And here we get a reading uh, from, from the tarot, right? And Eliot said that he was not actually that familiar with the tarot uh, cards. He just used them to fit his own purposes, right? But it's still, you know, it is important. So the protagonist card is the drowned Phoenician sailor, right? He remembers a line from the tempest those are pearls that were his eyes look and then we have other uh, characters from the pack of cards belladonna the man with three staves the wheel many critics have uh, wanted to look for these characters and these elements in later parts of the poem because here what the psychic is doing is to foretell you know the the, the future right of this character so maybe you can find some of these in later parts of the poem, like the one-eyed merchant, that's another one that is important. And uh, finally, she says, fear death by water. That, of course, is something that happens later on, as we will see. And her last message is, I see crowds of people walking around in a ring. The monotony of modern life, right? The tediousness of it, but also Dante, right? Um, the, the concentric circles of, of hell and of purgatory. So that's why we have these people walking around in a ring. And then after all that ominous stuff, we get this thank you right here, which means that the protagonist has paid the, the psychic. So we are brought down to, to reality just like that with that little phrase right there that seems to be out of nowhere when you read the poem for the first time. And in the final stanza of the first part, uh, we have for the first time this concept of the unreal city, which could be any city. It could be every Western city, but also in this case, it's um, London, right? We, we know for sure because he's talking about a crowd float over London Bridge so many. Crowd once again, right? We saw that word up there, like a few lines above, crowds of people walking around in a ring. So there are many echoes throughout this poem. And then this line right here from, you know, uh, Dante, I had not thought death hadn't done so many. Like he finds it incredible that, that so many people ha have died, you know, throughout the ages. They are sighing here in, in London, these people. Each man fixed his eyes before his feet. You know, this, this idea of the living dead, once again, the mechanical life. And all of a sudden he finds, he sees somebody that he knows, this Stetson named uh, like the hat, I, I believe, importantly, you know, for with reason. You were with, with me uh, in the ships at Miley. Miley is uh, a battle of, of the first Punic War. So we have the classical in the modern, which is, yeah, as you know, typical of modernism, right? This is the same reason why the character in this poem impersonates uh, Tiresias, for instance, just like uh, Leopold Bloom impersonated Ulysses and Stephen Dedalus impersonated Telemachus and Molly Bloom impersonated Penelope. So modernism is all about, you know, making those connections to the classical world. In this case, we have a weird situation here because you can think about this guy being identified, you know, or singled out in this crowd. Hey, Stetson, you know, that corpse you planted last year in your garden, has it begun to sprout? It's like, okay, you know, shut up. Everybody's hearing, right? Let's not talk about this. But here you have the burial of the dead, right? So uh, an explanation for that title right there. And famously, the first part of the poem ends with this phrase from this line from Baudelaire, right? Uh, you hypocrite reader, right? my likeness, my, my brother there. He's trying to 
connect with the reader by saying, you know, there are many, many connections between him and basically everybody who reads the poem. The second part, the title comes from a satirical play by Thomas Middleton, A Game of Chess, right? There's a, an element there of the concept of seduction, which is going to become important in later parts of the poem too. And this first part mimics uh, some lines from Antony and Cleopatra by Shakespeare. In the original, I seem to remember it said the barge she sat in like a burnished throne. Here it's the chair, right? So it's a modern scene, but described very, very detailed, right? From in a way that seems much more grandiloquent than that. You have many elements here, like the fruited vines, the seven branched candelabra. You see like very opulent kind of stuff, the glitter of her jewels, but it's a modern scene. It does, just doesn't sound like it, right? Satin cases in vials of ivory and colored glass and all that. This is one of the most detailed descriptions that you get in the entire poem. Look at this one. Above the antique mantle was displayed as though a window gave upon the sylvan scene the change of Philomel by the barbarous king so rudely forced. The story of Philomela and Tereus, right? And uh, she is turned into a nightingale. This is another you know, another recurring theme, this this what happened between this couple, Philomela and Terius. So keep that in mind because that becomes important also as we get to the end of the poem. And I really like the ending here of this stanza right here, under the firelight, under the brush, her hair spread out in fiery points, glowed into words, then would be savagely still. What we have next is a conversation between a couple. Okay, and what many people say about this is that it is probably um, a reflection of the situation between Elliot and his first wife, Vivian, who had mental health issues, just like Elliot had himself, right? But uh, the dialogue, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's taken verbatim from, from real life, you know, like, look at this, my nerves are bad, right? All of this questioning and, and trying to get an answer from the protagonist of the poem who could be Eliot himself, but his answers are not actually expressed. They, they are internal. You know, he, he, I, I think because of the lack of quotation marks here that he is not saying this, he's just um, thinking this, right? So she's asking him and trying to get something out of him, but he says something like, I think we are in rat's alley where the dead men lost their bones. And she keeps asking, you know, there's uh, some anxiety going on here, maybe some paranoia, something like that. Like, what is the noise, right? Noises are tremendously bothersome in those cases. Do you know nothing? Do you see nothing? Do you remember nothing? And the reply, I remember those are pearls that were his eyes. So he's thinking back at those those times when he went to the psychic, for instance, and that is the response right here. Then at one point when she's asking, she continues to talk to him, he remembers this popular song of the Shakespearean rag, right? So there's a disconnection right here between the two of them. Uh, what shall we do tomorrow? What shall we ever do? The hot water at 10, and if it rains, a closed car at 4, and we shall play a game of chess, pressing lidless eyes and waiting for a knock upon the door. And there you have the title of this section of the poem. The last part here, the last uh, stanza of the second part of the poem, is a scene that happens at a pub. So once again, you know, you can think of this character, okay, I'm going to the psychic, you know, then I go back home, uh, I, I have this scene with my wife, then I go out again, I go to a pub, and there's a woman who is telling a story to another woman about this person that they both know probably named Lil. And we know that we're at a pub because we are constantly reminded that the place is about to close, right? So it, it's, a, it's a very banal uh, situation that, that we have here. You know, she says, think of poor Albert. He's been married, he's been in the army four years and wants a good time. And if you don't give it him, there's others will, right? So it's this woman whose husband has been uh, in the army and he's coming back home. And uh, that, that is, you know, the, the kind of situation, the, the pettiness and the shallowness that would bother a speaker or a protagonist like the one we have here. Um, you ought to be ashamed, I said, to look so antique, right? And the problem here is that this woman has taken pills. She's talking about an abortion here, right? 
It's them pills I took to bring it off, she said. The chemist said it would be all right, but I've never been the same. She has had many kids and has nearly died of one of the pregnancies. So um, that is what's going on here. And one of the reasons why she says she does not look her best. And then, you know, the pub closes. So that conversation is over. We have some drunken, uh, you know, greetings right here. And finally, this line from Hamlet. These are the last lines spoken by Ophelia. Good night, ladies. Good night, sweet ladies. Good night. Good night. I remember in the facsimile of the wasteland, Pound had written a note under this. I'm paraphrasing here. I think he wrote something like excellent or something like that. He really liked the incorporation of um, those lines by Ophelia. The title of the third part, which is the fire sermon, comes, of course, from a sermon by the Buddha. And here the scene is the river. Okay, the river where people, you know, get together to, to do some intimate stuff at night. The nymphs are departed. The nymphs, of course, refer to uh, that way in a, you know, in a sarcastic or ironic way. The river bears no empty bottles, sandwich papers, silk, hand, silk handkerchiefs, and, or any of these other testimony, you know, of summer nights. Once again, we have the nymphs are departed and also their friends, the loitering heirs of city directors departed, have left no addresses. So there is this theme of seduction here, you know, it's like they get together, they take care of business, they leave and, and that's it, right? Nobody cares about anything. It's almost mechanical. There's no meaning to it. Now there's an interesting part here that uh, says a rat crept softly through the vegetation dragging its slimy belly on the bank while I was fishing in the Dahl Canal. So we are introduced to the image of fishing. And the character, the main uh, character, could be considered an incarnation of the Fisher King. So that's why this is important. Other lines that echo uh, other works of literature, other poems, but at the back, at my back, from time to time, I hear some reference to uh, Andrew Marvell's to his coy mistress, that famous great poem too but then we are led to something different the sound of horns and motors right which uh, shall bring sweeney to mrs porter in the spring sweeney is a character that has appeared before in eliot's poetry and he embodies mediocrity right he appeared in uh, the poems sweeney among the nightingales and another one was sweeney erect so that is a reference it's a self-reference right there and the final line from Paul Verlaine, right? Uh, the, these voices of children chanting or singing in the dome. Then some bird noises, right? Some bird sounds or, or songs, if you will. So brutally forced once again. And the reference once again to Tereus and his, um, you know, uh, and Philomela, right? The, the scene uh, between them and her change into a nightingale. Once again, we come back to Unreal City, which could be any city, but this time with a specific emphasis on this character, Mr. Eugenides, the Smyrna merchant. Remember the one-eyed merchant from that uh, part where we had the psychic, right? And he asks, the protagonist asked me in demotic French to luncheon at the Cannon Street Hotel, followed by a weekend at the Metropole. That's all he says about this. So he's reluctant to speak about this. It's something that he doesn't really dwell on. Did something happen between the two of them that he just wants to leave to our imagination? That is really a possibility that we can consider here. Then we have a section that begins at the violet hour, right? When the human engine waits like a taxi throbbing, waiting. And we are introduced to the figure of Tiresias, who Eliot said was the central figure of the poem. He, in a way, sees everything that happens in the poem. He's a witness, right? Eliot said he's not, he's not really a character, okay? He did not call, it, call Tiresias a character, but he's the central figure of the poem. Even though he's blind, he can see, he can foretell, and all of these things, right? So I, Tiresias, though blind, throbbing between two lives, right? Because Tiresias had been both man and woman. That is why he's a great figure as a central figure because he embodies everybody, right? He, uh, he, he has seen everything. He has experienced everything from both perspectives. So we have once again at the violet hour, 
the evening hour that strives homeward and brings the sailor home from sea. The type is home at tea time. So the contrast right there, the sailor home from sea seems like something like out of the Odyssey or something like that. And right then, right next, we have the type is home at tea time. So she clears her breakfast. She's uh, drying her clothes, her drying combinations touched by the sun's last rays, right? She's waiting for a man, of course, and then the man arrives. He, the young man, carbuncular, arrives, a small house, agent's clerk, with one bold stare, etc., right? They have dinner together, right? And this is what happens. The meal is ended, she is bored and tired, endeavors to engage her in caresses, which still are unreproved if undesired. Flushed and decided, he assaults at once, exploring hands encounter no defense. His vanity requires no response and makes a welcome of indifference. There is no love, no passion, right? It's mechanical, it's just going through the motions. So we have that concept of the banality of modern life that, that just permeates everything, you know, even the relationships between men and women. After that, she turns and looks at moments in the glass, hardly aware of her departed lover. And her final thought is this. Well, now that's done and I'm glad it's over, right? So, and then she puts a record on. So it's, you know, that banality, that, that pointlessness of it all. And we get here to this part that uh, says, this music crept by me upon the waters. It is signaling, it is uh, making us aware that what's, what we're going to hear now is a music that was heard by the protagonist. So as I said before, you can think of this as, as this guy walking around. Remember the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock? That is also a poem about walking around. Let us go then you and I when the evening spread out against the sky, etc. Right? So he's walking around and witnessing some of these things, hearing some of these voices. Then we get to these songs right here. The one that begins the river sweats, right? These are the songs of the Thames daughters, which we are meant to compare to the Rhine daughters from from Wagner's Twilight of the Gods, right? But also uh, a scene from the Purgatorio in Canto V, where Dante speaks to three spirits. So there's a connection there with Wagner uh, and also with uh, Dante. And the connection with Wagner is signaled by this lamentation right here. The vaya la 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 ya, va la 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 ya la la, all that, right? And this is uh, the connection here with the three Dems daughters slash Rhine daughters, right? In this case, this line right here, Reich, Richmond and, and Q undid me, right? Um, that is what signals the collection, the connection with the character of La Pia from the Purgatorio. These are women who have been seduced and abandoned, right? And they are basically telling what their experience was like. In this case, by Richmond, I raised my knees, supine on the floor of a narrow canoe. The other one says, you know, my feet are at Moorgate. And, and she says, after the event, he wept. He promised a new start. But that was it, right? And the last one says, something that reminds me also of uh, what happened in the first part. You know, I can connect nothing with nothing. Remember, I knew nothing from that hyacinth episode. So there are connections all over the place and echoes all over the place. We end with uh, two important texts. One uh, is, of course, St. Augustine's Confessions, right? To Carthage, then I came. Carthage is this place of lust, this place of unholy loves, as he says, concupiscence, right? And to support that, we have the voice of the Buddha from the fire sermon, burning, 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 burning. And then burning is repeated. We have a total of five burnings, uh, one for each of the five senses. The eye is burning, the ear is burning, the tongue is burning, etc., etc. Everything is burning with the fire of lust, which is the same thing that Augustine is saying right here. And the words in the middle are, of course, also from St. Augustine. So we have here converging, coming together, the East and the West in a similar, uh, basically the same theme. And we get to part four, which I think it's important to highlight that. This is a death, right? It's death by water. Fear death by water, the psychic said. And that's what happens here. This represents the death of the protagonist. You can see that in terms of uh, sim symbolically or, you know, literally. Uh, Phlebas the Phoenician. So we have the, the drowned Phoenician sailor, if you remember that. 
And then also, if you get towards the end, Gentile or Jew, oh, you who turned the wheel. The wheel was another one of the cards that the psychic showed the protagonist. So this, is, uh, this marks a turning point in the poem before we get to the last part, whose title comes from the Upanishads, right? So we, we are in the East here. You know, we have really entered a, a different area. Now, Eliot in his notes says that there are three important elements, at least to the first part of this fifth uh, section of the poem, and those are the journey to Emmaus from the Bible, the approach to the Chapel Perilous, right, from Arthurian legend, and then finally the, the contemporary to Eliot, right, decay of Eastern Europe. So the first thing we have here, you know, when you read all of these uh, after the torchlight, after the torchlight red on sweaty faces, after the frosty silence in the gardens, the agony and stony places. So we have stony places once again. The gardens could be a, a reference to the Garden of Gethsemane, right? This is after Christ's death. These are the apostles thinking about this. Prison and palace and reverberation. You know, Christ imprisoned, but also trying to, you know, explain or asking to, to explain himself in those palaces. He who was living is now dead. We who are living are now dying with little patience. So Christ was living, now he's dead. But they are not dead, they're, they're living, but they are, they're dying. So that is what I was saying before about the living dead, you know, in, in this poem. Dying with a little patience, right? All we need is just a little patience, as one of my friends said some time ago. Here is no water, but only rock. In this second stanza, we are introduced to this dryness, to this rocky place. This is something that repeats itself throughout. Rock with no water, right? If there were water, there's this desperate desire for water. If there were only water amongst the rock, but all they find is dry, sterile thunder without rain. And that continues in this little song right here. If there were water and no rock, if there were rock and also water and water, etc., and it concludes with but there is no water, you know? It's like no matter what you do, it doesn't. Uh, you just cannot find it. This part I really like. Who is the third who walks always beside you? It's, uh, of course, a, a reference to the story of uh, the journey to Emmaus, right? But also, Eliot tells us um, that he read about the Antarctic expeditions, and there was a delusion that the expeditioners experienced in which they thought that there was always one more person than they could count. And you have the, the white road right here for the ice and everything. So I, I really like that part because of the connection with Emmaus, but also because of the Antarctic expeditions. Who is that on the other side of you, right? Who is that other person that we cannot count, but, but we feel that is there? Then we have a sound in the air, murmur of maternal lamentation, the lamentation of Mary after the death of Christ. And hordes, right? Who are those hooded hordes? swarming over endless plains, stumbling in cracked earth. This part right here is uh, inspired by Hermann Hesse, the falling towers, all of these cities, Jerusalem, Athens, Alexandria, Vienna, London, the decay, right, of, of the falling towers. But once again, it's unreal, unreal city, could be any city. Now this passage right here, the one with the woman, I think this is probably the most enigmatic passage to me. There are no notes about this, no notes from Eliot, no notes from anybody that I know of, right? I have probably read something about this at some point in my life, but I honestly don't remember. I just think it's a very striking passage, this woman drawing her long hair out tight, you know, and fiddling this whisper music on those strings and bats with baby faces, crawling head downward down a blackened wall. It's, it's just, a, just amazing. It's, it's completely, you know, creepy but but i have no idea how it fits with the with the rest of the poem that is that would be the one part where i'm like this is really enigmatic then uh we have the arrival at the chapel right over the tumbled graves about the chapel the chapel perilous which is the culmination of the search for the holy grail right there is the empty chapel only the winds home and then we have this bird uh, only a cock stood on the roof tree, Cocorico, Cocorico, in a flash of lightning, then a damp gust bringing rain. So we finally get 
that rain, that purifying, salvific rain. That is what rain means in, in this poem, right? The rain that is going to uh, mean a rebirth, right? A renewal of everything. And now we really are in the, in the east right here because we have the Ganges River, the Himalaya Mountains, right? And finally, what the thunder said. Then spoke the thunder, da. And we have this syllable, right? This is an episode from the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, right? So we are really here in, in the territory of Eastern philosophy, and we have one syllable that can be interpreted in three ways. When I read this, I, I was thinking of the uh, that story, you know, about the blind man and the elephant. I think it is also a Hindu story, so that would make sense. They touch the elephant in different places, and each one says, uh, you know, the elephant is like the big leaf of a tree. The elephant is like a snake. The elephant is like the trunk of a tree, because each one of them is touching the elephant in a different place. And here we have something similar. We have one syllable, but that can be interpreted or read in different ways. The first word is data, which means to give, right? So that is one interpretation that they give to the thunder that only says da, you know, and here we have the second one, which is dayatvam, which means sympathize. We think of the key, each in his prison, thinking of the key, each confirms a prison. So it's the prison of the ego, right? What it's saying here is you need to transcend that. You need to sympathize with other people, find the connection, because otherwise you're just imprisoned in your own self. And the final word we have is damyata, which means control. And the image here is that of a boat, right? The hand expert with sail and oar, the sea was calm. Your heart would have responded gaily when invited, beating obedient to controlling hands. So the sense of control right there. So the message is give, sympathize and control. This is what the thunder says. Now the last lines of the poem are really a great example of patch writing. So many things are coming together here. All of these lines basically are taken from someplace else. It, it's a, it's a, just a quotation. It's from different sources, right? But the voices come together. I sat upon the shore fishing. So the Fisher King, you know, once again, a central uh, figure here in the poem. Shall I at least set my lands in order? A line from Isaiah, from the book of Isaiah. Then we get that famous song about the London Bridge. A line from Dante. The purgatory, right? He hid in the fire that purifies them. Then we have this, once again, that takes us to um, Philomela, right? Quando fiam uti calidon, o swallow, swallow. That line from Nerval's poem El Desdichado, Le Prince d'Aquitaine à la Tour Aboli, uh, the Prince of Aquitaine at the ruined tower. This, this was my introduction to Narval, by, by the way, and, and that of many other people, you know, uh, because Eliot chose to appropriate this line and, and to uh, signal this author right here. And then we have this line right here, these fragments I have shored against my ruins, reminds me of that heap of broken images, you know, the broken images would be the fragments. Uh, all of these fragments, these fragments in the sense of this poem, this is a fragmented poem, it's a fragmented epic. Um, but, you know, we put it together in order to, to reach some kind of a, you know, of a description of um, what, what the world is like and also our own life. You know, back when I was talking about that um, passage where you can see the conversation, failed conversation between the character and his wife, I forgot to mention something that is very important, but I'll mention it here. Eliot actually saw this poem as a very personal poem. You know, people saw, said, uh, critics said, oh, you know, this represents and this gives, gives voice to the disillusionment of a generation. But Eliot, what he said was actually, and I quote here, to me, it was only the relief of a personal and wholly insignificant grouse against life. It is just a piece of rhythmical grumbling. So to him, it was a very personal poem, you know? And other people, you know, related to it. They connected with it and they found meaning in it. But it all begins with him as a person, right? It begins with the poet himself and then, or herself. And then you extend that and maybe somebody will connect with that. We have a line from the Spanish tragedy, that, that play, right? About Hieronymus Madigan. And then once again, the repetition of what the thunder said, data, dayatvam, damyata. And the ending, which is very important, the word shanti repeated three times, which is 
the meaning of that is peace, uh, the peace that 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 passes understanding. That that is the way that Eliot put it in his notes. So there is a sense of closure right there that comes from the east, right? Not from the west, because the west is kind of messed up, as as you can tell from the descriptions of all of these things that we have seen. So uh, that is just one possible introduction, one possible approach to the poem. I hope that you found it useful and that uh, that that helps you, you know, to to make sense of this poem. There are so many things that can be said about it, you know. Uh, it's just very, very complex, very broad and very deep in many ways. But um, that is one possible way of approaching it. And I just wanted to share that with you in this anniversary of the publication of The Wasteland. All right, my friends, that was my assessment or my analysis of The Wasteland. It's a little bit of an introduction also, an overview to celebrate the 100th birthday of this poem, of its publication in book form. Do you have any questions, any comments? What has been your experience of the poem? Have you had any uh, positive experiences with it, negative experiences? I would like to hear your thoughts on The Wasteland, on Eliot, or on anything that is related to this. So as always, I appreciate your comments, recommendations, analyses, recipes, etc. Thank you so much for stopping by and have a wonderful day.